About where Cadron Creek and the Arkansas River converge, which happens to be on the western edge of Conway, there was an early settlement laid out here in the very early part of the 1800s, Cadron Settlement. There were about 35 families or so that lived here, and eventually this blockhouse was built, which served as a fort, a residence, a tavern, and a fur trading business with the French and Cherokees. This area's history actually dates back about 10,000 years. We have evidence from about 8,000 BC um, during what they call the archaic period, if you're an archaeologist. Um, there were these people called the Dalton culture and um, they made these very distinctive stone tools. We've found examples of those here within about 10 to 15 feet of where we're standing. Fast forward now to the late 1700s. At that time, this, this part of North America was owned by Spain. Spain claimed it first, then it went to um, French ownership and they sort of traded it back and forth. I tell my students when we're doing talks about it that whoever needed money, they sold this big piece of property to them. Um, and that continued up until about 1803 when Napoleon needed to finance a war and Spain didn't want to buy it back, so he sold it to the United States. And that's when we have Thomas Jefferson selling his library to raise funds to buy the Louisiana Purchase. And then in the early 1800s, uh, a settler by the name of John McElmurray. Yes, John McElmurray, um, he came on the scene around 1808, um, and we think he may have visited the area and then gone back home, back across the Mississippi and told some family members um, after the Louisiana Purchase and after it was okay for people to actually start moving in around 1808, 1809, um, he brought some family members here and we have evidence of him here between 1808 and 1811 and uh, he's very well established with a trading post by 1818. And that's about when the blockhouse was built. Yes, we don't know exactly when the blockhouse was constructed, but sometime between 1812 and about 1818, we think it was built. Um, by 1818, we have Thomas Nuttall arriving on the scene as a kind of as a tourist, a naturalist, and he writes about it. And that's our earliest account of the of the house itself. So the blockhouse was first used as a fort. Well, a, a blockhouse construction is is very unique because it's it's a fortified cabin. It's built in such a way that it's easily defensible. Um, it's a more of a sturdy construction than a log cabin. Uh, so you can live in it, you can hole up in it if the mean and nasty people are trying to hurt you. And, um, and it was used as a trading post. So it, it sort of served all of those functions. At the time that it was really going full swing, it would have been right after the New Madrid earthquake because that's what really brought a lot of the people in. Some of them had received land grants, so they already had the land, but they were living across the river in Missouri. And then after everything just kind of turned upside down, they came in. It was pretty hard scrabble, the lifestyle, because this is pretty, as it is now, rocky ground, and they had to break it. Um, so the women just kind of tried to raise the kids and the uh, gardens and the men went out after the game. Um, pretty much as we envision the idyllic lifestyle, but it was really pretty rough. They had to, uh, to work hard and that's one reason they moved on to a little bit more genteel things toward the towns. This is actually the second reconstructed blockhouse built in 1998. The Blockhouse is open the second Saturday of every month with various programs held by the Faulkner County Museum. This area is also located along the Trail of Tears. Five Native American tribes pass through here on land and water, the Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole. In 1834, a large group of Cherokees were stranded here by low water, and after being struck by a cholera epidemic, many died. Cadron Settlement Park also happens to have Conway's only mountain bike trail, which is actually a really great one.
I love this trail. It's got a lot of challenging parts to it, a lot of steep downhills, a lot of steep uphills. And uh, I mean, it's just got some drops about two or three feet high. And I would encourage anyone to come out here and give it a try. It's a lot of fun. We try to come out here with the good weather, uh, probably at least once a week. Uh, I think my favorite parts are the bridges and especially like the big downhills. Um, it's pretty challenging, but um, if you ride this trail often, then other trails will be a lot easier for you. So I really like it and it's local. So um, I think they do a good job keeping it up and we always have a really good time when we come out here. At the Mountain Bike Trailhead is also an ideal spot to stick around for a Cadron Settlement Park sunset overlooking the Arkansas River. There are only two places on earth where you can find excellent quality quartz crystals, Brazil and in the Washita mountain range in West Arkansas. We're at the Sweet Surrender Crystal Mine, northeast of Mount Ida, the quartz crystal capital of the world. So first things first, when a person comes out here, how do you know exactly what you're looking at in the dirt? In okay, when you're out here in the dirt, first thing you're gonna see is a bunch of rocks and mm -hmm. you're gonna see a bunch of dirt, you're gonna see a bunch of shale. So I suggest to people when they get up there to get up close and personal and look maybe in a two foot to a foot diagonal area so they can start looking for more shape and shine. All these rocks are gonna look like this, but mm -hmm. if you turn them over, and you start seeing bumps, mm -hmm. clean it off a little bit and you can start seeing some black glass or some shapes. And all these crystals here, the more black they look, the more water clear they're gonna be when they get cleaned up. Mm. Now, if you want to, you can just take it and throw it in the garden just like this and let nature take its course. Or you can hose all the dirt off of it and then put it in muratic acid. And I suggest that you use it in a plastic or ceramic container with a lid. Use it outside away from anything metal and follow the directions. And when you're done cleaning it, you can either take it and have it cut or you can just set it in your garden and these will look like diamonds every time the sun hits it. Now you really don't need any sophisticated tools, uh, just an old screwdriver like this will do and most of the times you really don't even have to dig once you get this going because you can just, you know, like right here, pick up and a cluster of, looks like quartz, right there, and uh, oh, right here, and these, love my goodness, look right here, huh. Oh, oh, look, right here, right here, right here, look. Oh, yeah. Look at that oh, one. Golly. Look. Huh. See those points? Yeah. Look at that black glass. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Look. That is a beauty. <laughs> oh, now here's another one, too, right here. <laughs> See? Yeah. Okay, you come up here from Louisiana to do Quite often. <laughs> not, not too many quartz in Louisiana. No, not many rocks. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, tell us about your experience every time you come up. Oh, we just love it. It's um, a chance to get out into nature. And of course, I love crystals and I hooked my husband into it. So now he loves the rocks too. So um, we just enjoy it. And I imagine uh, every day you come here, it's it's a different... Oh, every day is different. You never know what you're going to find. And then the thing is, because of the uh, minerals and calcium, and the iron, you take something home thinking it's nothing and you get home and clean it up and you have something really pretty. Rising up out of the water like some Atlantis, when water levels are low at Beaver Lake in northwest Arkansas, the remnants of Montanay show up. But just what was Montanay all about? Our visit to the lost town of Montanay is with the man who wrote the book on Montanay, James Hales. Well, James, back around 1900, I mean, this was quite the place. It was. <laughs> this was a fabulous resort built by an eccentric millionaire named William Hope Coyne Harvey. And today we're standing in the remains of one of his, uh, it's going to be one of his hotels, the Clubhouse Hotel. It, it was going to be a fabulous hotel and, and resort. And this was the centerpiece of, of, of five other hotels that he was going to build. And he never actually finished this one, but it was going to be three stories high and uh, it round turrets. It looked kind of like a, a, an old, old medieval castle. And it's even supposed to have a, a 18 foot waterfall in the lobby. So it was, going, it was going to be pretty fabulous. Whether it was buildings or amenities, William Harvey spared no expense. He even had a gondola shipped in from Venice, Italy to use in his resort town of Montanay. So this is what's left of Missouri Row. He had all these rows, Arkansas Row, Oklahoma Row, Missouri Row. That is correct. This was M Missouri Row. It was a, a log hotel. It was 305 feet long. It had 40 rooms. Uh, each room was open to the outside on a porch and, and, and uh, each room was heated by our fireplace. And that's the uh, fireplace there at the chimney. That's the only fireplace left standing. There's still fireplaces that's laying on, down up there. But uh, this particular fireplace had six openings and actually heated six different rooms. The only structure of Montanay still standing that can be seen at normal lake levels is the tower section of Oklahoma Row Hotel. It originally had an elaborate log structure attached to it, which since then has been moved to another location nearby the Montanay site. So James, that big long log structure that was moved away from here, this is where it was originally. That is correct. This was, uh, this was the last great hotel that Cohen Harvey built in 1909. Uh, it was the biggest log structure in the world, 310 feet long, 40,000 logs, uh, tremendous amount of concrete, and after we built this hotel, the resort kind of dwindled in about 1920. People were no longer coming here. But uh, this was a fabulous hotel. The, the tower down there was on the end, and that was like the honeymoon suites where it looked out over the, the lake that he built. Uh, and yeah, when the lake came in in, in, 19, in the 1960s, this, the Corps of Engineers auctioned this hotel off, the building off, and a, a guy built it and he moved it up there in front of Montanay Inn. Now tell us about these uh, rooms underneath. There's a lot of stories about those rooms and I'm not sure anybody knows for sure. But some of the rooms are actually rooms that, that you can t see where 
to be occupied. They had uh, got doors and windows and uh, uh, you see where they uh, had toilet facilities. But some of them are just rooms that go up under the hotel that are, we think they were used for storage. And, uh, and, and I think the ones that were occupied were, was probably for the help, for the hired help. But they're still there and a lot of people still explore them today and it's pretty fascinating. Montanay was also the site of Arkansas's only presidential convention after Harvey started the Liberty Party in 1931. He was going to have the convention right here at Montanay to, to elect a nominee to run for president. His amphitheater that he built, uh, he brought people, delegates from all over the United States here for the Liberty Party, and he thought that 10,000 people were going to show up and actually you only got 760 people. And they're just mostly a bunch of troublemakers and none of them could agree on a candidate so they nominated him. He's 82 years old. And so he accepted, of course, and ran, <laughs> ran for president at 82 years old. And uh, he thought he would come in, he thought he would come in third, but he ended up coming in six, distant six out of six. And he only got, uh, just a few thousand votes in all of Arkansas, and here in Rogers, where people knew him, he only got two votes. Harvey died in 1936 and was entombed next to his oldest son in this concrete mausoleum overlooking Beaver Lake. And those times when Beaver Lake is this low, I guess people come and kind of uh, snoop around, explore, and like sections of the amphitheater becomes exposed. They do. Uh, the lake in 2006, the lake was even a lot lower than it is now, and all of the all the ruins of the old town come up out of the out of the water. And on the weekends, especially on the weekends when the weather is warm, the place is covered with people. Cars everywhere, people crawling all over the ruins, people walking down to the old amphitheater, just very, very interested. And it's, uh, yeah, most, most of them don't really know what they're looking at, but they, they know that it's historic. I did grow up in Rogers my whole life. Um, I kind of saw this area as well, uh, progress with the water. And occasionally, you know, it goes down, so you can see certain aspects of it, such as the amphitheater, which is great. Um, I do think that people need to learn more about the history of this location. It had a big part in the growth of the city. I don't really understand why I'm so drawn to this area, but that's just what it is. There's something charismatic about this place. I just love coming here. I love what it is, what it used to be, and just the story just gets me. I just get obsessed with it. Well, looking back at pictures, I wish that we could go back, but looking back at pictures, I believe that it was the place to be. It was a resort, it was a health place, it was somewhere to go to be with family and uh, just escape from reality a little bit. And the fact that Harvey created it for that purpose is wonderful. Thanks to the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and the Arkansas Canoe Club, there are quite a few really neat water trails around the state. And one of them happens to be the Grassy Lake Water Trail inside the Bell Slough Wildlife Management Area near Mayflower. Most water trails you can't do a loop, but this one is. And we had some folks from the Arkansas Canoe Club that spent many hours out here finding that path um, because it's a series of sloughs and ponds basically that goes through cypress, cypress and tupelo trees. So it was a lot of time spent with GPS, map and compass, 
in finding the route. Yeah. Speaking of uh, compass and GPS, I was telling you earlier, if it wasn't blazed here, I'd be completely lost here. <laughs> completely. Yeah, some parts are more clear than others, but you know, and that's something to tell people is, you know, keep an eye on your markers as you go along. It's a good idea to print a map off from our website. And if you have GPS and map and compass skills, certainly bring them. Yeah. We shot this segment in February, but you may want to wait until later in the spring to float the trail when everything starts to turn a little greener. We think it's a beautiful area. Now, it feels like spring to us today, yeah. but it doesn't really look like spring. I can see where the trees are starting to bud out, but just, you know, imagine this area when the tupelo yeah. are blooming, the cypress. Um, have their, their beautiful green needles, you'll have duckweed all over the water, and lots of migratory birds and things are also flitting through the woods. If you should happen to float Grassy Lake during waterfowl hunting season, there is something that you need to keep in mind. Yeah, you know, we share this area with duck hunters. And so they're going to be out here early in the mornings and they can stay on the water till noon. So we kind of go second shift, those of us that want to come paddle. So when the duck hunters need to be off by noon and shooting hours are over, uh, the trail's open for paddlers to use. It kind of works out. It's warmer, you know, the second half of the day. So I'll let the duck hunters have it for that cold early morning. But definitely something to keep in mind about sharing this area with the hunters who are also using it. Another thing to keep in mind is that the Grassy Lake Water Trail is not accessible the entire year round. Yeah, this is seasonal. It's a green tree reservoir. So we hold water on in this area during the winter months for migratory waterfowl. So the water, depending on rain, will stay here through the spring and, and sometimes into the summer. So it just depends on what mother nature brings, but the water is starting you know, to drain out as summer goes along. It was brand new to me and a few others about uh, three or four years ago and uh, looked like a great place to put your kayak or your canoe in. And the um, uh, first time we came out, uh, uh, the hunters had uh, kind of their own system of uh, little reflectors and stuff around, um, but uh, it was very easy to get lost. Um, we ended up, uh, you know, kind of struggling through a bunch of brush and stuff and, and, uh, uh, but we didn't give up. We decided to come back and, uh, this time we brought the GPS and, uh, and, uh, started, uh, finding the best ways to go and, uh, you know, following some of those reflectors that the hunters had, had uh, put out because those guys know what they're doing. So uh, we figured we'd uh, <laughs> kind of see what, see what was up. And the first place we found was this uh, beautiful lake out here because a lot of them come out this way uh, because this is where all the waterfowl uh, come. And uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, the, the trail is uh, a friend of mine um, did most of the mapping and she spent probably over a year out here finding the best route wow. <laughs> around and then uh, uh, several of us helped her uh, put up the signs to mark the trail. Um, I think it's absolutely one of the best uh, places in the state and it's right here Close to Little Rock, close to Conway, Central Arkansas, uh, people are starting to pick up on it now. So get in a canoe or a kayak and enjoy Grassy Lake for yourself. And to view this episode again or any one of our others, 
visit our website at aetn.org slash exploring Arkansas. And don't forget to like us on our Facebook fan page. And we'll see you again the next time for another exciting adventure on Exploring Arkansas.